3, 4, 5. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to the third day of the conference called International Conference on Islamic Economics and Finance. And on this third day, we have our keynote speeches in the afternoon, which will start by Dr. Samuel Suayla. Uh, first, uh, I will just introduce him briefly, then he will do his presentation about, uh, called a framework for future economics. Uh, Dr. Samia Suelem, born in 1965, uh, is a prominent expert in the field of Islamic finance, a senior economist, Islamic researcher, and author of several specialized books. Dr. Suelem is the acting director general of IRTI and head of financial product development center at the Islamic Development Bank. He was deputy director of Islamic Research and Training Institute, which is IRTI, at the IDB group. He earned his MA from Southern Illinois University in 1990 and his PhD from Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri, USA. Uh, as I just said, his presentation's title is A Framework for Future Economics. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Thank you, Sir Sir Hafsa. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Can you hear me? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa nuala. I'm greatly uh, honored today to participate in this uh, landmark uh, conference on Islamic economics and finance. Over the years, uh, the conference was a major uh, 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 contributor to our knowledge and understanding of Islamic economics and finance, and also of building good relationships between researchers, practitioners, and experts and policymakers. Uh, in the opening session of this conference on Sunday, Professor Bulo, the president of the ICU, encouraged researchers to bring in new ideas and, quote, not to be afraid to think of what has never been thought before, which is a very bold uh, and uh, very encouraging statement. Uh, I wish my presentation today uh, is of that sort. Unfortunately, most of the issues that I will be discussing today have been already discussed and thought of thoroughly in the literature. However, my objective is to propose a framework for reformulating economics to be up to the challenges we are all facing. There is already a large literature on the shortcomings of mainstream economics. However, there is yet to emerge a coherent framework to build or to rebuild economics on sound grounds uh, so that it will become relevant to real world challenges and whereby Islamic finance will be naturally included within this framework. This is the objective of, of my presentation. Good, so I assume you all are able to hear me very well. If you don't mind, allow me to share my screen with you because I'm going to uh, uh, make a short presentation. Not too short, actually. OK. So let's ask a simple question. OK, what is different in this crisis, in the COVID-19 uh, crisis? Well, I'm sure you are aware that in this crisis, it became very clear that health is very essential to the economy. Now, this is not something very familiar uh, in mainstream economics. They do talk about health, but that's not part of the uh, intermediate uh, or advanced microeconomics. It comes only as specialization later on. Now, health is a kind of a public good. And public goods are very different from ordinary goods that uh, people discuss 
in, in mainstream economics. It is true that public goods are discussed probably at the end of the semester or at the end of the textbook, but they are not viewed as essential to the economy. Now, there are many ways to identify or to define public goods, but one simple way to look at it is that public goods are indivisible goods. It is either we all or the vast majority of people in the economy are in or none. It is not that uh, you can be healthy and I, I don't mind that if I get sick. And that's very clear in the pandemic. It is not the case that, well, I don't care if my neighbor or my colleague has the coronavirus. It will affect me directly or indirectly. So it is either we are all healthy or we are all facing a great risk. There is another clear example of public goods order. Unless we all follow the rules, uh, it will be chaos. It will be a disaster. Imagine if drivers, uh, some of the drivers do not respect traffic rules. Then it will be a problem. Now, not only that this will be a problem to those who, who follow the rules, but also those who follow the rules will feel disadvantaged or taken advantage of and therefore they will also start breaking the rules and then without any rules, it will be chaos. And that's why stability is a public good. A an economy cannot be stable if some people follow the rules and some, other, and some don't. So we have all to abide and follow these rules so that the it's just like we are all in the same boat. So this concept, is, is very essential to the real world uh, economies, but it is foreign, almost foreign to, to mainstream economics. And that's why we need laws, we need regulations, we need standards, and that's why values and institutions are very essential. Values and institutions are important to coordinate the activities of the agents. Another very important example of a public good are the commons or common resources. Imagine a community living uh, uh, on an island and they have a vital source like uh, water, sweet water, or drinking water that is shared by the community. Now, they have to coordinate between themselves in order to consume the, the water in a manner that make it sustainable. If each member try to behave selfishly, trying to consume as much water as possible, for example, to produce plant or to, to raise cattle and so on. This will make all members of the community competing against themselves, and therefore they will be depleting the resource in a very short period of time. And that's what's called tragedy of the commons. I mean, the common resources, they have to be coordinated because ultimately they are finite, and therefore people have to, or members of the community, they have to coordinate the way they consume that resource. And that's why it is, that's how to get sustainable development. Sustainable development requires coordination and cooperation. And that shows a different uh, side of scarcity. When we say resources are scarce, obviously all resources are finite and therefore scarce in this sense. However, unless we coordinate our activities in consuming these resources, then we, we will be adding another dimension of scarcity, social scarcity, to, so to speak, that will make things even worse. Now, these kind of things are called social dilemmas. In a, in a social dilemma, what is true for the individual is not necessarily true for the group. Individual rationality deviates from group rationality. What is good for the individual does not always coincide with what is good for the group. This is uh, 180 uh, degrees opposite of what standard new classical theory says that just follow self-interest and then everyone will be better off. That's not always the case. And it is frequently the other way around. It is frequently that we have to have coordination in order to achieve group rationality. And this also, also uh, 
called the fallacy of composition, the same thing. So the point is that there are many, many public goods. There are many cases in which we face this fallacy of composition to the extent that we really have to rebuild economic theory on this basis. Some people would say, oh, we know there are public goods uh, chapter. There are chapters on public goods and textbooks, and there is a branch of economics called public economics. But this argument assumes that you can have economics without public goods, because public goods are only one chapter on the on microeconomics book or, or a branch of economics. So you could have other branches without public goods. Well, okay, but that's not true. They, there cannot be an economy without these public goods. There is no economy, uh, no market can, can operate normally without having these uh, uh, public goods or commons in place. And that requires uh, coordination and cooperation between agents. And one famous example of these social dilemmas is prisoner's dilemma again. Are you following me? Can you see the screen? Can you see the mouse moving across the screen? Uh, let me see. Okay, I assume you can see the mouse moving around. Uh, let me see the chat. Okay, good. So in a, in, in a present dilemma, we have two players, player one and player two. And each player has two strategies, either to cooperate or to defect. If both cooperate, they get a certain outcome. Let's say player one will get four and player two will get four. However, if player two decides to cooperate, then there is an incentive for player one to shift from cooperation to defection. Why? Because he will be getting now five instead of four. So given that player two will cooperate, player one will have an incentive to deviate and shift to defection. But if that is the case, if player knows that would, would be the result, then player two would be better off to defect, okay? Uh, because that's, that's, he, he cannot get a, a better, well, I think I, I need to adjust the payoffs here a bit. But it, in general, what would happen is that player two would also have an incentive to defect and therefore we end up with both parties defecting while they have, should have been better off cooperating, okay? I need to, uh, uh, I need to adjust the payoffs. I think uh, payoffs are not quite accurate, but I hope you can get the point. Another example is trust. Trust is a public good. And unless we all behave honestly, and truthfully, social interactions will cease to be productive. So what would happen? Unless we trust each other, if, if, if you trust me, I should trust you, but then I might make some gains if I cheat while you trust me, because that will, be, that will bring me maybe some additional profit in the, in the short term. But if everyone cheats, we are all losers. So we end up with a worse situation than if, if we all uh, trust each other. So trust is also another dilemma that unless we coordinate and cooperate each, uh, with each other, we end up with uh, the, uh, uh, the outcome that is worse for everyone. Now this brings us to the point that positive versus normative economics. It is not enough to say we should be truthful, we should be honest, we should uh, understand why those people who, who cheat, why do they cheat? Why those who uh, are truthful are actually truthful? So within this framework, we are able to see both the good behavior and bad behavior. And then from that framework, we can address the issue of how to, to provide incentives for people in order to be truthful, to be honest, and to cooperate. So we have to balance the positive versus the normative. We cannot provide normative recommendations unless we have a good picture of what's going on and why those who are behaving badly do so and why those who behave in a good manner do so. Within this framework, we can uh, provide recommendations 
for all public goods and for all uh, uh, social dynamics. Now we come to Islamic finance. What happens in Islamic finance? Well, there are many aspects of Islamic finance. So let me focus on a few uh, aspects, but are the major aspect. One is trade versus riba. Now we know that a loan is a transaction, is an exchange of two identical objects. A loan as such cannot create wealth unless it is connected to trade. Can economy, can an economy rely completely on interest-based lending? Is it possible to imagine an economy where everyone is simply lending others for interest? Could that economy flourish? And the answer, of course, not. There will be no production, there will be no trade, there will be no wealth creation if everyone decides simply to lend others and, and collect interest. That economy will collapse. So it's a fallacy, it's a fallacy of composition. Some people could live off interest uh, uh, from lending others, but it cannot be the case that everyone can live off interest from lending the others. So interest-based lending is actually a fallacy. It is, it's, it's a subject to the fallacy of composition. On the other hand, trade is not subject to the fallacy of composition. If every member of the society involves in trading, whatever goods or services they have in surplus, then actually the market will expand and everyone will be better off. If more people are selling the same good, then there will be a correction in the market. The price will go down such that people will have an incentive to shift to another goods or service. So uh, the market is self-correcting through the price mechanism. Once we are in trade, once we are dealing with trade, we have self-correcting uh, mechanism through the market or the price uh, system. But for lending, it is not. There is no self-correcting mechanism in interest-based lending. Because the moment the lender is unable to pay, all you have to do is restructure the loan, re-lend, reschedule, refinance, and then extend the loan, get more debt, get more interest, and keep adding, keep piling up debt. There is no self-correcting mechanism in interest-based lending. And that's why it's subject to the fallacy of composition. While trade is not subject to the fallacy of composition, why? Because it is subject to the uh, uh, price self-correcting mechanism. And again, we can think of it this way that if people trade, if all people trade, they will be better off. However, some people might, bet, might find it difficult to trade or to produce because it is risky and so on. Why should I take risk? Why should I take on risk of trade or risk of goods and services? I'll simply lend money and collect, collect more money. So there is an incentive for some people to deviate from real economic activity and simply sit on the side, lend money, and collect more money through uh, uh, interest-based lending. But if everyone does the same, the economy will collapse. They all lose. Now let's get to another aspect of Islamic finance, which is risk sharing. We, we always uh, hear that equity is expensive and that's why uh, uh, companies, they do not prefer to, to, to finance their equity or partnership in general. So there is a reason why equity is expensive because of high leverage. Most companies or many companies are highly leveraged and if that is the case, equity becomes risky. Why? Because you have so much debt backed by so little equity. So that equity will be too risky and therefore would require a large amount of return to compensate for that risk and therefore it will become uh, uh, expensive. So that means if we have more equity, then equity will be less risky and therefore less expensive. So per dollar of equity, uh, the cost will be less if we have more equity than if we have less equity. Okay, so if we have more debt and less equity, equity will be, become more risky and therefore more expensive. However, the more we expand equity, the less the cost of a dollar of equity become because it becomes less risky. Why? Because you have less debt. The more debt you have, the higher the leverage you have, the more risky the business becomes. 
and the more risky they become or vulnerable the economy itself will be. Okay, again, we have a dilemma here. We have a prisoner dilemma or a social dilemma. If everyone is, is uh, having more equity and low leverage, everyone is better off. Why? Because, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, because uh, the economy is resilient, uh, companies have the potential to grow and so on. But then some companies would have an incentive to deviate and uh, expand through debt because this will bring them higher return on equity, ROE. So measured by our return on equity, having additional debt will make some companies better off. But then if everyone shifts to higher, uh, to high leverage strategy, then uh, they all become more vulnerable and the economy will be more risky and they will not be able to absorb shocks or withstand shocks or crises like this crisis that we are facing now. So here's the point. We have to start from the assumption that the market is a social institution, it's a social interaction. And for the vast majority of social interactions, we are facing social dilemmas. We are facing public goods issues. So we have to redefine economic problem. It is not solving for scarcity. It is how to resolve social dilemmas because social dilemmas are actually the real threat or the real source of scarcity. From a natural point of view, even though the resources in, in, on earth are finite, but uh, in principle, they will, be, uh, they will accommodate our needs if we are able to manage our needs and our wants. So the problem primarily is social. So the, the economic problem is how to resolve social dynamics. A proper framework to coordinate individual rationality with group rationality is required. And this is at heart is a social problem. Uh, some studies point out that this present dilemma game kind of interaction does not exist in nature. Uh, molecules, atoms, and, and uh, physical objects, they all follow the rules faithfully. No atom will deviate. No atom will cheat. No molecule will cheat. They all follow the rules and therefore uh, there is a reason to expect that Prisoner dilemma game will not uh, uh, be observed in nature. They are primarily observed in social, in human interactions. Why? Because humans have the, the capability, have the choice to be honest or not to be honest, to be faithful or not to be faithful. So we have this choice and from that it becomes a problem. We face a problem of social dilemma. And that's the essence of Islamic economics. So Islamic economics is not only about prohibiting riba, encouraging charity, social solidarity. These are obviously very important and essential, but they are part of a general problem of that coordinating the behavior of economic agents in order to achieve the higher uh, outcome or the, mo or the most valuable outcome of, of uh, wealth production and wealth creation and wealth distribution. So here's the point. It is not that the markets are not helpful or valuable. Markets are valuable. Markets are important. Free markets are important. They have to, they, 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 they produce, they are capable of creating wealth. But to have a free market, we must have social institutions. We must have public goods. There is no free market without public goods, without uh, first resolving the problem of social value. So this is the new framework, or this is a framework, it's already there, it's already in the, in the literature. But what we are simply suggesting here is that this framework naturally includes principles of Islamic economics, but also it provides both positive and normative framework for uh, economists to uh, address economic problems and to explain the crisis that mainstream economics failed miserably in, in predicting and in explaining. With that, I conclude. And uh, I think I did not uh, exceed the half an hour that uh, was allocated to me. 
So I thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity. I thank uh, the attendants who uh, were generous enough to uh, listen to this lecture. With this, I conclude. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, doctor, for your presentation and also that uh, you kept the time quite uh, well. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, you basically talked about in your presentation the public and tragedy of commons, social dilemmas, and uh, then how Islamic finance and in general Islamic economics can actually provide an alternative framework to all these things. Uh, you especially shared with us the game theoretical application for between trade and lending instead, which is, I think, an uh, important and different point of view. Uh, then you said that market is basically a social interaction uh, and which can help us to redefine the economic problem, not uh, by taking the scarcity as the basic problem, but instead uh, uh, social dilemmas, because it's basically a social interaction. And for that, we need to also focus on the group rationality, not only the individual rationality. Uh, as far as I could follow, I think that were the pinpoints of your presentation. And uh, thanks a lot for that, Doctor. Uh, I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed the presentation and learned from that. Uh, Thanks, thanks a lot for joining us, uh, Doctor. Okay, I'll send you the presentation. <laughs> you can uh, share yeah. it on the website, okay? Yeah, thanks, Thank thanks you. A lot for that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.